Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University in the Perception Action Podcast again. Um, in this video, what I wanted to do is address one of the biggest comments, biggest feedback I receive regarding using the ecological approach, the constraints-led approach for coaching, uh, applying it to skill acquisition and training. And that is the issue of terminology, right? I get lots and lots of people tell me, why do you guys use so much complicated words, right? Why is there so many complicated terminology, degeneracy, self-organization, constraints? Why do we need all that, right? It makes it so impenetrable for me um, I, and hard to understand, you know, wh why do we do that? So what I want to do today is I want to kind of justify and explain why we use the terms we do. And also I'm going to give... Uh, first pass at explaining, in my words, what some of these mean and where they come from and why they use them, right? So I'm not here to foreshadow. I'm not here to give you a pass, right, that you don't need to use these terms and learn them, right? That's not what the purpose is here. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do. I got to foreshadow. I got lots of feedback when I, I posted about doing this, and I got lots of suggestions for terms. So I'm probably going to do a second one of these where I get into some other terms. But first off, before I start, um, a lot of this is going to build on the uh, other presentation that I gave that I think hopefully a lot of people have seen. Um, the one I called the two skill acquisition approaches, key differences, right? So I would suggest that you watch that first if you haven't, right? Because what I'm going to do is talk a lot, a lot about the terms in the right side of that table, right? That For the ecological approach. So a lot of the reason and motivation and rationale for why we use certain terms because comes from the logic of the ecological approach, right? Comes from the ideas of direct perception, perspective control, things like that. So knowing about some of those things will, I think will help. So I would recommend that. It's not absolutely necessary, but I, I think I would recommend you watch that first. So what the, starting with the question I raised, right? Why do we use such complicated terms in this approach, right? Why do we use them? Some of the more negative and, and cynical things I've heard that people uh, say on, online, mostly on so social media, is that we're using these terms to try to sound smart, right? So that we hide the fact that we don't really understand what's going on skill. We don't know how to coach. You know, I'm just an academic. I don't really know the practicalities of what it, being a real coach is. So I'm just making up, I'm just using these words to make you sound smart. Another very cynical thing I hear sometimes is uh, I'm putting, we're putting up barriers to entry, right? If we make these really fancy words and complicated things, then it's hard for you as a coach to understand. So you need to hire us as consultants, right? Uh, no, right? If you really believe those things, then uh, I would suggest you just stop the video now and, and not bother, right? Um, that's not what is going on at all, right? Um, they're not, that's not what we're trying to do at all. You know, the, the amount of free, uh, no, free content and effort you can, you know, things you can get from, you know, not, I'll put my, myself like this video, Keith Davids, um, um, Michael Turvey, Carl Newell, right? That they put out trying to make people understand these things. If you think that this is motivated by some, you know, evil agenda, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and and those people are smart. They don't need to sound smart, right? So um, if you think that, then I'm really sad for you because that is not what's going on. This is based in science, right? Science is about sharing and, and developing knowledge, right, for everybody. Um, so stop, stop saying those things. That's silly, right? The reason we use complex terms in the ecological approach is for a few different reasons. One, one is because we're recognizing that skill acquisition in sports is not an isolated, one-off thing that's separate from everything else we do in behavior, right? It's linked, it's connected with many of the other things we do and many of the other systems in the body, right? So it's linked to biology, it's linked to physics, right? It's not on its own, right? It's linked to concepts in psychology, right? And we're recognizing that this, these processes of adaptation and learning that happen when you're on a field learning how to kick a soccer ball are in many ways functionally similar to the same things that are happening at the levels of your cell, right? Well, when you're coordinating limbs on the soccer field, things that are happening in your brain, they're all connected, right? 
right? So for that reason, bringing in and using the same terms as that people use in other fields of science, dynamical systems, biology, developmental psychology, right, allows us to connect these things, right? Why wouldn't we if they're the, if they're sim if we think they're similar processes, right? If we connect these, if we use the word, for example, I'm going to talk about today, degeneracy. I know that's one of the ones that annoys people. Right? But degeneracy is a word that is used in biology right, all the time. right, And it's a very similar process to what we think happens on the sports field. So by not using that word, we're breaking this connection. We're, we're denying ourselves of all this knowledge and theory that we could use to help understand skill acquisition. right? So why wouldn't we connect with things that are similar and related? Right? The other issue is that a lot of the terms we use in uh, so ecological approach have very specific meanings and they're used for a specific reason because they're based on those theoretical assumptions I talked about in my last presentation, right? And those theoretical assumptions are distinct and different from the traditional information processing approach, right? So if we don't use the terminology and we start just using everyday language and simplifying things, you know, that's nice, right? But what happens is things all often get lost in the wash, right? We start to get really imprecise with our language and we lose the meaning. We lose the assumptions. We lose those, right? In the, my last presentation, the roots of the tree, right? They get lost because our words start to get, you know, imprecise and, and loose, right? And that for me as a, you know, someone that's developing this theory and understanding it is important, right? What it's going to lead to, and I'll show you examples of this later, is misapplication, right? If you don't understand what a constraint is, you can't use the constraints-led approach effectively, right? You may be able to come up with something in practice that works, but you're not using the constraints-led approach, right? So you need to understand and use these terms consistently and precisely to, to act, connect with the theory and the underlying ideas. So that's why, that's why, and I'll talk more about why I think we're doing. So the bottom line is, right, so here's the list of things that I want to cover, the terms, right? I'm not vain enough to think that I'm going to rock up here and suddenly give explanations that suddenly make you understand all of these, right? Um, you need to, if you really want to understand these, it's going to take multiple attempts, listening, reading things, listening to different people, you know, going to different things. That's what I had to do, right? I didn't grasp all of these all the, right away either. Um, so I'm going to try to give you another description and, and information about them so you, you understand them, but I can't, there's, I don't have magic bullets here today that suddenly ma will make you understand these, right? So these are the terms that, that I want to try to uh, tackle today. And as I said, uh, in my last presentation, I used the analogy of a tree, right? These, these, there's roots of a tree in the ecological approach that build from each other, right? So there's ideas that build off one another, right? And so the, the, for me, the, the root of the tree is, is understanding, accepting that we're uh, the idea of a complex system, right? So we're going to go through that, talk a little bit about nonlinear pedagogy. Then I'm going to get into things related to perception, attunement, affordance, calibration, embodied, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about coordination, right? Um, the, this this really annoying term, people don't like degeneracy, self-organization, and then what a, a tractor is, right? So I hope this, this is, these things are useful. Um, I'm going to try to show, both explain the terms in, in a way that I think of them, and then talk about some of the implications for coaching. And as I said, there's a bunch more that people suggested to me that I'll, I'll try to get to in a separate video, okay? So complex system, so the roots of the tree, for, for the, in the terminology, right? So in the ecological approach, you know, our foundation is we're accepting and we're acknowledging and, you know, assuming that the uh, skill arises from the elements of a, what's called a complex adaptive system, okay? So a human beings are a complex adaptive system, right? So by system, we mean an, a network of integrated, connected, interacting, uh, components, right? Um, it depends what level you're talking about, but for skill, we're mostly talking about the parts of your body, right? So I have my elbow, my shoulder, my wrist, my knee. These are the components that are going to work together to interact to allow me to achieve my goal and perform my skill, right? So that's what it, the system we're talking about. Adaptive, by adaptive, we mean, you no, know, it's responsive to internal changes in our body, 
you know, and getting fatigued and external changes in our environment. The system is always evolving, adapting. Um, you know, it's never static, right? It's always changing how we, we, we organize the system. Okay? Complex, right? So one way to understand the idea of a complex system is to, di to distinguish and contrast a complicated system versus a complex system. Okay. So a complicated system, an, an example that a lot of people use and I like to use too is sending a, a, a rocket to the moon, right? So the recent SpaceX sending a ship to, to outer space or this International Space Station. That process, right, is not easy, right? It took a ton of really smart people, scientists, right? But in general, it's very, very predictable, right? If we follow all the steps right, in how to prepare a rocket, build it, you know, what we need to do to send it off into space, to what we need to train a crew, right? The out, the, if we put all those inputs in, in the right order, in the right way, the output is very predictable, right? Look at all the space missions we've done. And there's, with, all, with only a couple unfortunate cases, it's, the outcome has been exactly what we expected, right? So a complicated system the outputs are highly predictable from the inputs, right? As long as you do the inputs thing in the right order, in the right way, we get what we expect. Contrast that with a complex system, right? A complex system, there's a lot of different angle, uh, um, examples. You know, an athlete is one of them. One of the ones that most people can, can um, understand and, and sympathize with is raising kids, right? If you have two kids or more, you'll immediately grasp this idea, right? The inputs, are, the outputs are not predictable at all from the outputs, from the inputs. The outputs are not in predictable from the inputs, right? What I mean by that is you can have one kid that you raise in a certain way, you toilet train them, you get them to sleep, you, you discipline them in a certain way, the inputs, those things cannot work at all for your second kid or your third kid and so on, right? In a complex system, the inputs interact in unpredictable, often random ways, such that we cannot reliably just predict the output from what we put in, right? Another example I like to use is think about the best party you ever went to, right? What was there? Who were the people there? What was the music? What was the setting? What food and drinks did you have? I don't know if you've done this. I tried to do this once where you try to recreate that, right? You try to get all those elements there. What you'll find, what I found, was usually it'll be a failure, a spectacular failure, right? Because you cannot recreate an interaction between all of those elements, right? You can't just automatically turn it on, right? Because a party with a bunch of human beings is a complex system, right? So in the ecological approach, we're starting with this basis, right? The inputs we give, the athlete, the environment, the practice conditions, what we say are all going to act in very different, unpredictable ways such that we can never know exactly what the output is. It's not a formula for coaching, right? There's no formula, right? Because things are going to be unpredictable. The other concept, related concept you'll hear related to this idea is the difference between a, non, a linear and a nonlinear system, okay? So most people kind of understand this idea. A linear system, there's, um, you know, people that understand dynamical systems and mathematicians might be smashing their head against the table today because I'm going to really simplify things and, and maybe oversimplify them. But a linear system basically is a system in which the output, the change in the output is proportional to the change in the input, right? And a simple way we could think about that is imagine if the amount you improved when you're learning a new skill was directly related to how much you practiced, right? The more you practice, the better you get, right? That's a linear system. A linear system is generally also deterministic, meaning kind of the same thing as the complicated system, right? If we know what the inputs are, we can predict the outputs. With, so the, the inputs determine the outputs, right? So that's the idea of a complicated, uh, a linear system. In skill acquisition, for many, many years, we've accepted that really learning is not linear, right? So we've, we've acknowledged that there's a, a non-linear relationship, a fairly simple one, you know, and this is recognized in the classic power law of learning, which I've shown here, right? And I think everybody intuitively understands this. This is the law of diminishing returns, right? 
uh, at the start of practice, when you first start practicing, you get this steep, right? The steep part of the curve, right? Um, you learn uh, faster. And then as you get more and more skilled at something, you master it, the gains you get get smaller and smaller for each hour of practice you put in, right? That's the power law of practice. And by the way, I think I've said this in the podcast before, the idea that the learning curve is steep um, is a bad thing is completely wrong, right? The learning curve is steep. That's great, right? That means your performance is going up really fast with the more you practice. You want to be steep. The annoying part is when the learning curve is flat, right? Um, so this is the power law of practice. This is a basic nonlinear function, right? So the inputs we put down here are going to result in different outputs, performance, than the inputs we put later on, right? So they're not proportional. This is fine and good, right? Except it really describes uh, a, the overall average performance if you take a bunch of people, right? Um, if you, and you take averages and means, right? And, and one of the key uh, points about the ecological approach is we're not going to accept that group level of performance explains individuals, right? We're going to move beyond that idea, right? That the very long standing idea in, in motor learning and psychology. Right, if we look at an individual, right, they probably look more something like this, right? So they go have these peaks and valleys where they they make sudden improvements in one session and then drop back down, or they have periods of slow gains and followed by really fast gains, right? Why do we think this happens, and why do we how do we explain this in the ecological approach? Because we have these in, unpredictable interactions between the inputs, right? The task. The, the, the practice conditions you set, the environment, maybe it's raining one day, maybe it's windy, the individual constraints, right? Um, you know, a lot of people put forth the idea that when you're an you know, athlete practicing a lot, you're really showing up to practice with a different body every day, right? All the micro trauma is going in in your body, right? You have a different body every day. So you're having different interactions, right? So we can what we can get is some days these inner these constraints these these components inputs can combine together to produce this huge jump right this huge change in coordination pattern this huge shift in the way you're doing things where you have a huge gain one day then other days nothing can happen right um, this also relates to the idea of degeneracy right I'm going to talk to you there's more than one way to do things and also right if you from the ideas of differential learning. Right, what we're doing is adding, in practice, there's noise we're creating in the system. And noise, as the name suggests, is unpredictable, right? How it's going to react, right? Sometimes it's going to have a big effect, sometimes a small effect, right? So in a nonlinear system, there's not this input-output relationship, simple, uh, proportional, right? We're gonna have these, these crazy peaks and values, right? So from this, what we get is nonlinear pedagogy, right, which is kind of a link to the ecological approach. So what we're going to do is we're going to embrace this, right? We're going to embrace the fact that the system is complex, unpredictable, and nonlinear, right? We're going to take that into account in our model of skill acquisition and our coaching practice and our pedagogy. We're not going to try to ignore it, right? We're not going to try to wash over it and, and simplify it by talking about groups of people, okay? Um, so, and we're gonna, as I said before, we're not going to accept the idea that you can, that data from a group of people can always be applied to the individual, right? And so the term nonlinear pedagogy, right? What we're talking about there is designing learning activities and training that takes all of this into account and embraces the complex nonlinear nature of skill acquisition, right? So that's what simply what nonlinear pedagogy means. We're going to embrace these ideas and we're going to take them into account, right? So we're going to individualize training. We're going to accept the fact, um, we're not going to go with the idea, well, that, that won't work for most people, right? No, we're going to individualize. People have those different paths to learning, so we need to instruct them in different ways. We're not going to ignore these peaks and valleys. I hear some people say, well, if you look at it at the right scale or overall, it's roughly linear. No, we're not going to accept that. We're going to embrace the fact that some days you're going to have big gains, some days you're going to have no gains, right? We're going to accept that we don't know the solution. We can't predict the outputs. There's no formula, right? We're going to have to experiment and we're going to have to adapt, okay? We're going to be patient, right? We're going to accept that we can't just build the skill from the bottom up, 
right, from the components, right? So I don't teach you how to run in soccer, how to run, then dribble, then pass, then decide how to pass, then, you know, in a very linear fashion, right? We're going to accept that you have to learn all those things together, right? And it's going to be shaped by our practice. We're going to move away from having strict learning objectives from each practice session, right? Um, if you embrace this nonlinear uh, complex system, then we're not going to hit objectives every practice, right? We can't predict what we're going to get, right? And we're going to really focus on the idea of what's called co-adaptive design, right? So being a coach is not set it and forget it. It's going to require adjustments, right? It's going to require uh, changing the practice conditions based on what you see. It's going to require the ath getting input from the athlete on what they're feeling, what they, what they see, right? And adapting. So that's co-adaptive means the athlete and the coach adapting together, right? So that's the basics of nonlinear pedagogy. It's really nothing to it. You know, it's just embracing this view as the athlete as a complex system. Okay. So some more terminology. So that's the basic idea. That's the roots of the tree. Now let's talk about perception. Some of the ideas, how we bring in information to control our actions, or perform our skills, right? So one of the big terms that you'll hear used there is attunement or attune, right? So the reason with that we use that word, right, attunement, is because of the part tune, right? Because it reflects kind of a radio analogy, right, of, of how we pick up and sense information in our environment, right? So when you're listening to the radio, you turn the dial, right, and you, and, and you get it in the right spot and you pick up the radio station, okay, and suddenly you can hear it and everything that's going on. That is essentially how we believe perception works in the ecological approach, right? You pick up the signal by just edu you know, focusing on it. It's out there in the environment. It's always out there, right? The radio transmitter is always broadcasting. You just need to tune into it. You need to what we call educate your attention sometimes. Once you tune into it, there's no processing required, right? Your radio is not doing any processing of the signal when you listen to a radio station, right? As soon as you tune in, all the information is there, right? We don't need to interpret it, process it add to it. No, it's all there, right? And the third component of the radio analogy, why we call it attunement, is the radio signal is not stored in the radio, right? Um, as soon as we turn the, the dial or shut the radio off, the signal is gone, right? It's not stored anywhere. We're just establishing a relationship to our environment. By setting the dial in the right place, we're establishing a relationship between what we hear at the speaker and the environment, the radio signal, right? So that's the reason we use this word attunement, right? This it captures the idea of direct perception, how we think things are perceived in in the ecological approach, right? If you have to describe this in other words, right? Acceptable alternatives are, you know, we pick up information, we detect information, right? Um, those are acceptable, not great, perfect alternatives. The problem with starting getting loose with language, right? When you say, oh, attunement's a fancy word. I don't want to use that. The problem is people start saying words like recall. I recall, recognize, or retrieve it. That, those are memory processes, right? That's not what's going on in ecological approach. Also, people start saying, I compute, the athlete computes or analyzes or processes or interprets, right? Those are information processing ideas, right? So attunement has a, within it, though it's a, you know, a big word, it captures all the elements of how we believe direct perception happens, right? That's why we use that word, right? Why is it important for coaching? Um, we, on Twitter uh, the other day, we were having a little bit of discussion about uh, what knowledge is and what learning is, and um, uh, there was this great quote um, that I think Carl, uh, Carl Woods was in their newest article from a writer named Ingold, Learning is about attending to things rather than acquiring the knowledge that absolves us of the need to do so, right? I love that quote. It perfectly captures what we think is going on in the ecological approach. Learning is about picking up information from the environment. It's not about the knowledge and skill. It's not about the knowledge you have stored in your head. The radio signal is not in the radio, right? The key is learning how to tune in, right? So if you follow this, uh, this approach, right, your goal is not about acquiring information, sitting on a, in front of a whiteboard, 
telling your athlete tons of things about what to do. It's about keeping them attuned in the moment um, with their environment, this relationship with their environment. And for me, I don't really, I, I get the idea of athlete-centered coaching, right? Letting the athletes take um, responsibility for their learning, right? And that's super important. And essentially, the ecological approach cap it has that in it. But I would rather use the athlete in the environment coaching because athlete-centered coaching promotes this asymmetry, this idea that skill is all about what's in the athlete. It's not. It's all about the relationship between the athlete and their environment, right? Attending to things, right? Attending means you're linked to your environment. It's not about acquiring things, right? It's not about being pulled separate from your environment, right? So I think that's really, really important. Second term, affordances, right? So this is a, a key word. Affordances is another one that's used in a lot of different ways. And even within ecological psychologists, people, psychology people argue, you know, whether they're relational or, you know, things like that. But I don't want to get into all that. The idea of affordance, you know, the way that I think about it. So we have this radio signal we're turned in, tuned into. What's in the radio single, signal, right? In the traditional view, what we're picking up, what we're sensing is things like, so imagine where I'm running on the, the player in the black uniform, I'm running to tackle this this player. What am I picking up? What am I perceiving? Right in the traditional view, I'm I'm sensing the variables from physics. I'm sensing the distance of the player, the speed of the player, the direction of the player's running. I'm inputting those into my internal model to make a prediction about where they're going to be in the future. Then I'm going to program a movement to get there. Right. So I'm I'm make I'm using my internal model, my processing to make a decision what I'm going to do, then program an action. In the ecological view, we, again, like I talked about in that, that other video I, I did, we believe that the perception, decision-making, acting is all one and the same part, is all part of the same process, right? So decisions emerge from control, action is involved in perception, right? So what we perceive are not the physical parameters of the world, right? So we don't perceive distances, size, uh, you know, speeds, um, and then have to process in, so process in some way and, and relate it to our goal. What we perceive, and this is Gibson's idea, of course, is that we perceive, directly perceive opportunities for action, right, from our environment, what the environment affords us, right? And... This is, then. there's no better example of this for me than a cat, right? If you have a cat, you know they do this. Cats could care less what things are designed for, right? For almost anything a cat can find, it affords lying down and sleeping, right? So a cat detects, like picks up from their environment information about what things afford, right? What they offer to it, what it can they can do with it. They don't perceive that's a sink, that's a railing, right? They don't have to do that. They're, they're looking for things related to their goal of going to sleep, right? So that's the idea of affordances. Um, so affordance is an opportunity for action, right? So let me give you an example from sports and how we think these kind of these, these uh, influence, right? So imagine I'm running to tackle that player in rugby. In the ecological approach, I'm doing this by establishing this control law, this relationship between my behavior and, and the environment. So I, in, in, I talked about this in the other video. If I want to tackle that rugby player, all I have to do is keep adjusting my running speed such that I keep this law, which is based on information about the, run, the, the player's angle and time to collision, right? Um, so I'm not perceiving those things. I'm not, I'm not um, trying to judge when they'll be there and where they are, right? I'm using that information just in this control law. So all I'm doing is if this, if this information, this rule or law starts to break, right? Um, then I speed up or slow down or change my angle, right? So when I'm doing this, okay, what I have is what's called a current future, right? So when I'm running, I can, if I'm maintaining this law, if I'm, if I'm making running so this relationship is true, then my current future is I'm going to get to the spot and, and, and tackle the, ru the runner, right? Um, my current future, though, is also importantly related to my action capabilities, right? And this is something uh, Brett Fagen really uh, documented well in this affordance-based control idea, right? So in this control law, there's a, a required running speed I have to generate, which is based on information. 
If my current feature is that the required speed I need to run based on my control law is greater than the maximum running speed I can generate, then um, is is um, it's sorry I had this flipped around. Then that should be then the affordance is it's not tackleable. I can't do this right. If I uh, I can't achieve what I want, um, if it's less than right. So if the required speed is less than my maximum speed, then it is tackleable. So those terms should be reversed. I apologize. So what I'm perceiving, it picking up is not the distance of the runner, not the speed of the runner. I'm controlling my behavior and I'm picking up these affordances based on my action capabilities, whether that runner is tackleable or not based on the current future, what's happening right now. And from that, from this perceived affordance, I change my goal or intention. If if I in the situation where it's not tackleable, I'm gonna have to change and have a different goal, right? So that's what we mean by affordance. We're picking up these opportunities for action. And that, sticking with rugby, the, another example from the work of people, uh, Kathy Craig and colleagues, right? If we look at, in rugby, the gap between the players in a line, right? Which we, they call gap one, gap two, gap three. These sizes of these gaps, right? Afford different opportunities for action, right? Running with the ball directly, making a short pass to a teammate, making a long pass to a teammate. And what you can see here is, you know, based on the size of the gaps you can create, you actually see the frequency of these different choices emerge, right? So this is an idea is important for coaching, right? Because what we're trying to do in practice design is invite, invite these affordances, invite opportunities for action, manipulate the gaps between players, manipulate the spacing, manipulate the size, manipulate the speeds, right? We're not trying to teach a player to learn how fast, to be able to judge how fast their opponent is running or how far away they are. We're learning, get them to learn to connect the information they're picking up with these opportunities for action, these affordances, right? So that's the idea of affordance. Okay. This also connects, um, importantly, with another term you'll hear a lot in ecological psychology, calibration, right? What does calibration mean? Well, going back to that rugby example, calibration means changing the parameters of your control law, the information movement control law, in response to internal and external changes in the environment, changes in constraints, which I'll get to in, in a bit. This critically requires that you interact with your environment, right? You can't know that you need to recalibrate. You can't, um, you can't get the information for recalibrating unless you interact with the environment, right? So again, here's an example. If I'm running using my control law here, imagine if the field starts to get muddy because it's raining or I become fatigued. It's late in the game. What that means is that, you know, to produce this required velocity in terms of the muscle forces I need is going to require more muscle force if the field is muddy or, the, the, you know, or I'm tired, right? So I'm going to need to adjust the parameters in my control law to take this into account. If I want to generate a certain required velocity, I'm going to need to give more muscle input, right? And that's exactly what calibration is, right? It's changing the parameters of these control laws in response to changes, both in, in, in my individual constraints and in the environmental constraints, okay? So that's what we mean by calibration. This all really fits into also another term you'll hear sometimes, the idea of that perception is embodied, in the ecological approach, okay? So what do we mean by that? Embodiment, right? So let's first think of traditional view of dis the disembodied view, right? So imagine we're trying to judge the perceived size of an object, right? So we have, uh, you know, a ball out on the field or, or uh, you know, a car or something. In the traditional view, the perceived size should be determined by the physical size, right? They should be related to each other. Maybe we'll make some error, but they should be related of it. Um, any t um, if the physical properties of an object don't change, right, then the perception shouldn't change, right? There's, there's no reason why. Well, you're getting the same visual angle from a ball, right? Why would anything else, if that doesn't change, it's the same distance away, it's the same ball, why would anything change, right? And in the traditional view, the job of the perceptual system is to accurately represent and measure these physical properties of the world, distances, size, speeds, right? But this doesn't seem to fit with what we see, right? And this is right, obviously not research. These are, you know, anecdotal observations, subjective opinions, but we hear them a lot. People say that 
the way they perceive the world changes based on their performance. Right? The balls look as big as grapefruits or small as aspirins, depending on how well you're performing. Um, things slow down. Another is another thing you you hear athletes say. These kind of you know a, a subjective impressions are really consistent with the the ecological view that perception is embodied, right? Which is you know Gibson comes from Gibson and Dennis Prophet is one that's really done a lot of work in this area. The idea here is that we're not passive perceptual perceiving devices. We're not just recording the things, the physical parameters of the world. Our perception system is designed to support action. So how we perceive the physical world depends on our capability to act on it, right? So the physical size of an object doesn't, the perceived size of an object is not going to just depend on its physical size. It's also going to pretend, depend on our skill level, how much fatigue we have, right? So our action capabilities. And Dennis has you know, shown this in some really cool experiments, well-known experiments. For example, if you get people to judge the slope of a hill, so they're moving this little uh, device here to match the angle of a hill. Um, if you get them to do it under those conditions, they'll say, they'll say or maybe match it to 20 degrees. If you put a backpack on them, a heavy backpack full of books, now you've changed their action capability, right? Their ability to walk up that hill has gotten more difficult. What you see is um, an increase. They say this hill's steeper, right? The hill hasn't changed. It's the same hill, right? It's the same physical hill. What's changed is your action capabilities, right? And here's kind of the, the data that he gets. Um, a colleague I used to have at, at the University of Birmingham, Frank Eves, did a lot of cool experiments with his grad student. Um, and... For example, he uh, looked at, he went to a mall, right, in the, in the middle of a mall in the city, and he looked at whether people decided to go um, up the stairs or uh, choose an escalator, right? And after they did that, what he did was have them judge the slope of the stairs, and he found that people that chose the escalator perceived the stairs to be steeper, right, even though they're the same stairs. Um, this also depends on, you know, things that influence your action capability, like your body weight, your age, your height, Right, whether it's easy to walk up the stairs or not. He also did a cool thing where he gave people a choice, right? Be, be, you know, he was in, a, I think this was in a subway in the, the T in, in Birmingham. He had people, you could, they gave away free things, right? You could choose uh, basically Gatorade or something with a lot of uh, energy in it, you know, a lot of carbs, or people pick water or something like that. And what he found interestingly is the choice they made related to, then he had them rate the steepness of the stairs, um, and it, it, those two things were related. People that chose things that were higher carbs, the Gatorade, presumably did so because they they want they had energy depletion, right? That's his idea. And when you're depleted in energy, you can't walk up the stairs as well, so they look steeper. So there's a lot of cool research in, in the body perception area, but that's the basic idea. Why does this all matter for coaching? This idea of affordance, a calibration, you know, uh, embodied perception. There's a couple of things. There's a lot of reasons, but a couple of things I always refer to. First, the poor. If your athlete is making poor decisions on the field, right? They're not passing when you think they should. They're not driving to the basket when you think they should. It might not be a you know a cognitive or perceptual problem. It might be an action capacity problem, right? If you cannot run or move in a certain way, you don't have the strength you're not going to perceive the affordances. They're not going to invite, they're not going to receive the invitation, right? Um, if you are not fast enough to get through that gap, the gap is not going to afford running through to you, right? Um, it's going to afford passing to somebody else, right? So this can be addressed by appropriate strength and conditioning and linking strength and conditioning. Also, right, it's really important to uh, play within yourself, right? Play, play within oneself, by having this appropriate calibration between your effectivities, which means your abilities, and the affordance, what's the environment operating. And for this, it's we know that it's really critical. You develop this calibration through experience, right? Having lots of variable conditions, learning how to adjust your control laws when things change, right? So it's really important. Another reason to have variability in practice. Okay, so those are kind of the perceptual terms I wanted to talk about. Let's move to more coordination terms. Okay. The first one, as I said, is one that people often talk about, degeneracy. What do, we, what do we mean by that? 
Well, first of all, um, what, let's start with the word degenerate, which we usually use as an insult, right? A degenerate, right, is someone that's moved away from the normal, the typical, right? So it's a weirdo, an abnormal, right? That really connects well with the idea of the ecological psychology in that we're not accepting that there's a normal, one ideal way to do things, right? We're accepting, right? So everyone in ecological psychology can raise up your hand. We're degenerates, right? We're proud of it, right? Because we're accepting we're not sticking with one ideal. There's no one ideal, right? We're moving away from the one all the time, right? So that's that's how we're at the root of the word degeneracy, right? Degeneracy, what that means is the ability of elements that are structurally different to come together and perform the same function, the same output, right? So we, it's like pe we can put different pieces of the puzzle together to do the same thing, right? And as an example, let's look at volleyball serving, right? So those are three different ways you can serve a volleyball, right? So what we're doing is we're putting together things that are structurally very different, my shoulder, my elbow, my wrist, you know, and we're combining them to do the same thing, get the ball over the net, right? So in, a, in the system, these different structures are interchangeable, right? So I can achieve my goal either with my shoulder or with my elbow or with a combination, and they're redundant. What that means, you know, redundants are, you know, when you're redundant in, in, in the UK, right, for people in America, redundant is a term they used when you get fired or let go, right? The no longer necessary, right? So redundant, right, your shoulder isn't necessary for serving a volleyball, right? Um, or your, your wrist isn't necessary, right? You don't have to bend your wrist to serve a volleyball because there's redundancy, right? There's other ways you can do it, okay? But no, when I perform a completely different skill, they, these may not be redundant, right? I can't use my shoulder in certain ways for other skills. Okay, so that's, that's the idea of degeneracy. The idea that we can combine things, different parts, to achieve the same function, right? And so you might be saying, well, why don't we just say that? <laughs> why don't we just say that's having multiple ways to do things, multiple solutions? Well, the reason we don't is because there's more to it than that, right? Particularly, a really critical point is degeneracy is not about cognitively, a cognitive process where you, you build your toolbox as an athlete, where you link, okay, I'm going to learn this to do when I'm going to learn how to do a slice shot in golf, you know, a, a draw in golf for this situation, right? A fade in this situation. It's not building your toolbox with a bunch of if X, then Y solutions, right? That's an information processing approach, right? So degeneracy is a very different view of how things are, are develop, right? They develop through, uh, as we'll get to in a second, self-organization, right? On their own, right? Through interactions with the environment. And critically, degeneracy is a property of multiple bi biological systems, right? You have degeneracy in your DNA, right? So we know that different DNA sequences can come together to produce the same uh, function, the same protein, right? The same genetic code, right? So, and there's no one there controlling or telling or deciding, right? So it's, it's a, this natural process that comes from adaptable response to the environment. And it's critical for several reasons, right? In your DNA, it makes your DNA robust, right? If you have an infectious attack that attacks a certain type of of, of a chemical or DNA, um, it doesn't destroy you, right? Because you have different ways to, to produce the same function, right? And the same is true with skill. If you come to a situation where one solution doesn't work, these redundancies allows you to adapt and adjust, okay? So redundancy is a lot more than just having multiple solutions, right? And I could go in a whole hour of, <laughs> on just degeneracy, but there's an importance in that term, okay? Um, so it's an adaptive response. Why this matters for coaching, it's an adaptive response to a changing environment we perform in, right? It's not giving an athlete a bunch of tools and solutions they can use in different situations. You can do that if you want, but you're not promoting degeneracy, right? You're, you're following an information processing approach if you do that. Okay. Um, also, you know, within inherent within this idea of degeneracy in, in coordination is this concept of self-organization. What do we mean by that, right? What we mean by uh, self-organization is we start with a, 
a, a set of things that are of elements that are unorganized, right? And somehow, almost if by magic, they are, are form some sort of organization or structure. And and from the from so from disorganization, organization or structure emerges, right? That's the another term you hear a lot, right? But critically, this happens without the guidance of some leader, CEO, boss, executive controller. And the classic example that everybody uses is what I've shown in the, that is birds, right? So birds, when they're flocking and flying, they form structures, right? Look at they're moving together in a coherent pattern. There's no boss bird, right? There's no one bird saying, okay, you do this, you do that, you do this. You go that way, I'll go this way, you go that way, right? This structure emerges through their interactions, right? There's no controller, okay? And emerge means come into existence as if out of nothing, right? That's the idea of self-organization. The interaction of our components with in the face of these constraints, right? And so self-organization fits within Newell's model of constraints. When we have these constraints, the components come together, right? And create a solution, a coordination pattern, a, a, a organization without anyone telling them how to do it, right? There's no central controller, right? And so this is a Newell's famous constraints model I talked about last time. I'm going to get into the definition of a constraint more in, in the next time. But if you for more information, there's that this resource page I created. There's there's the link there you can have a look at. Okay, so that's the idea of of self organization. Um, the last one I want to talk about today is the concept of an attractor, which I, I mentioned in the, the other presentation. So, building from the roots, right? We we have this complex, unpredictable system with no boss, right? There, we have a company where there's no CEO. Um, but even though we have this kind of chaos, we know that through this process of self-organization, there are going to be some patterns, some tendencies, some consistencies that emerge, okay? There are going to be locations or states that the system is going to gravitate to. Even though it's a complex, unpredictable system, it's going to gravitate to certain things. These things that it gravitates to are called attractors, right? The system is attracted to that state, okay? These critically are points of stability, right? And points of stability for two reasons. One is when the system gets there, right, it's going to tend to stay, right? Even if you perturb it or move it around, it's going to want to stay there. And two, it's going to tend to move back there every time you start in the action again, right? So you're consistently going to get back there, right? So an attractor is this, this state, this pattern, this location that you are pulled to, okay? And a classic example a lot of people use is talking about the coordination of our legs when we're walking, okay? So when we're walking, so if you go through a walking cycle, this is when you start a cycle, this is when you complete it. So a cycle is your legs moving forward and back. Um, adult walkers almost always follow the same pattern. Okay, so if you measure the phase, so the phase is basically the angular difference between your legs. So you start with your legs really apart, 100 degrees apart. At about halfway through your side, your, your legs are at 45 degrees. So they're separated by 45 degrees. One leg is kind of halfway through its full stride, the other compared to the other, right? That is an attractor, right? That state, that having that 45 degrees relationship is an attractor right? It's a thing that we tend to gravitate to when we walk, okay? Why? Why? And you can see that new, um, the other line on here shows kids. Um, new walkers don't have this, right? Because they're still learning to coordinate. Uh, as they, over time, their walking pattern, so this is a new infant, as within two months, it's getting very adult-like, right? Why do we have these attractors? Because we share common constraints. We share common anatomy, biomechanics, dynamics uh, of our system. So we're going to tend to self-organize in the same way, okay? Not completely the same way, but in very similar ways, right? And so that, that's the idea of a attractor, okay? Um, attractors, how do we find them if we're a coach, right? The way that we find the attractors is by changing what's called the control parameter, right? So we find something that we manipulate that drives this organization, 
right? And the example a lot of people use, if you drum with your fingers on the table or on a drum, right? What you find is you can't, there's two main attractors, in phase, which is hitting the table at the same time with both fingers, and antiphase, which is doing a drum roll. So having one finger in the air while the other is on the table, right? A control parameter for drumming is how fast I make you do it, the, for the frequency, right? And what we find at slow drumming, there's two attractors, right? This in phase and anti phase. If I make you keep going faster and faster and faster, um, the frequency, which is the control parameter, drives the organization so that there's only one attractor in phase movement. Almost everybody does completely in phase movement. <clears throat> you can try this for, your, for yourself on your table. Try to do a drum roll <clears throat> and keep going faster and faster and see what happens. Okay, so this in phase is the tractor. It's pulling the system towards it, right? Why is this important for coaching? <clears throat> in tractor, well, in the ecological approach, we believe that these attractors are what the invariants in the movement pattern are. These key features of being a good pitcher, of being a good hitter, right? Of being a good, doing a good kick and a penalty kick in soccer. The the key features that you see emerge come over and over again for the really elite performers are attractors the the states that the system is drawn to right the reason is the attractors create stability which, which you know if you listen to Franz Bosch Franz quote is that stability matters more than perfection perfection right so elite performance is not about doing the same thing over and over again perfect accuracy it's about maintaining stability having good attractors efficient attractors so at the same, so that these are really, really identifying these, coaching around them, creating constraints that push you, you know, help get an athlete to them, cueing about them is is the key to coaching, right? At the same time, all attractors are not good, right? Depending on the, the environment, you can also develop what are called inefficient or passive attractors, right? That do not help stabilize the system very well and will lead to movement patterns that are not really going to work in competition. For example, if you let an athlete move really slowly, they will they often develop these attractors that when you speed things up aren't going to work anymore, right? So coaching around understanding attractors is a, is a really, really important thing. Okay, so that's the, the terms I wanted to talk about today. Right? And as I said, I'm going to do more. So to sum up, the terms in the ecological approach are used because they have specific meanings, right? Attunement, self-organization, degeneracy have very specific meanings, right? They are connecting to a larger body of work within other disciplines of science, right? They have, and they're not just a quick fix. These are the ecological approaches, not here's top the top five tips on how to get better, right? It's linking to a very complex multifaceted theory, right? And for that reason, if you really want to understand it and apply it, and you don't have to as a coach, right? If you want to, it's probably going to take you multiple attempts to understand these con they're difficult concepts, right? Um, you're going to have to watch more videos of other people explaining them, and there's some online. You're going to have to read. You're going to have to do other things, talk with other people about it, right? That's the way I learned it. You know, I've been going at this 25 years, and some of them I'm still trying to understand, right? And I'm not trying to sound, I hope I don't come across as condescending or like being an elitist academic, but, you know, we don't expect acquiring skill to be easy for an athlete, why do we expect acquiring knowledge and being able to, to apply theory and motor learning effectively to be easy for a coach, right? Why should you be able to grasp this immediately, right? You shouldn't. It's difficult stuff, right? If you really want to learn it, and as I said, you don't have to, but if you really, really want to apply, it's not it's going to take some work and effort, okay? Um, you need to take the time to learn the key ideas, right? The other thing, I commonly hear this uh, on social meeting, right? If you can't explain something simply that it's no good, right? It means it's not a good theory, you don't understand it. Uh, that is complete nonsense, right? Yes, it's good to be able to explain something simply to people, to have an elevator pitch for your ideas, right? Of course, that's important. If you're trying to get a general audience who just wants a basic understanding of your ideas, uh, yeah, you need that. You need to be able to do that. That's part of being a good educator. 
Um, but if you actually want to apply it in any meaningful way, the idea that you should be able to explain it quickly and easily is nonsense, right? In what other discipline or science do we expect that, right? Do I expect I should be able to walk up to someone who has no engineering background and be able to explain how to build a bridge so they can go do it in five minutes, right? That's nonsense, right? Yes, you should be able to be able to explain these ideas simply, right, to a general audience who just wants to get the gist of it. But people that want to actually use it and apply anything in life, right, you need to put effort into understanding and it's not going to happen simply and right away. You're going to need to learn terms, right? We learn terms all the time in sports science. All, you had to learn all the anatomical terms, didn't you, right? Um, so, um, you know, again, I'm not trying to lecture. <laughs> it's coming across that way. But uh, it's just going to take some effort, right, if you really want to apply this all. Right, you know, this simple everything should be simple. I, I don't know where we get that idea, nothing else in life is so. Um, but that's just my view, okay. The other thing I worry about, right, is if we don't take the time to understand these terms and we say, Oh, let's just simplify, let's just put it in common words. What happens is we learn to use, l we lose the meaning, right, so that we don't apply things correctly and, and they're not going to be effective. An example is self organization, right. Oh, that's too complicated of a term. Why don't we just call that letting an athlete figure it out on their own? Well, the problem with that is self-organization is not athlete-centered coaching, right? It's not all of that. It doesn't, all, not all athlete-centered coaching ideas fit with self-organization. It's not just games-based coaching. Games-based coaching can be used either to self-organize or around the information process. It's not guided discovery. That's an information processing concept. It's not teaching games for understanding. That's an information processing concept, right? Understanding is not involved in the ecological approach, right? Um, it's not letting the athlete develop their knowledge about their game or their mental model, right? So if we get loose with what the, what instead of using self-organization, a precise term with a meaning, then we lose the meaning, right? We lose the ecological approach in it, right? And so that's what my worry is, right? So I know these terms are difficult, and, and, you know, it, it can make reading it really give you a headache, right? But they are important, right? They do have meanings, right? And it, this is, I know that this is hurt by some people using them inconsistently and inaccurately in different places you read and you get different definitions, right? That happens in all the time, right? And also in other disciplines. I'm trying to teach stats right now and people use, sometimes they call them variables, sometimes they call them factors, right? That happens in every discipline too. We got to fight through that, right, to understand it. Okay, so as I mentioned, I got too many suggestions to do in one thing. So next time, I'm going to tackle some of these issues: constraints, coordination, this idea of meta and multi-stability, and this one intrinsic dynamics. If you have any others, right, um, that you can think of, then I hope, uh, then please send them to me in some way. Um, as again, I said, I, I hope, I, I don't imagine that you suddenly understand all these things perfectly, but hopefully that was a little bit useful in, in adding, right? Chipping away at the rock of understanding these, these complicated ideas, okay? So Dan, for those that don't know, most people listening and watching, I'm sure know this, um, you can find more about me, um, about all the stuff I do at perceptionaction.com, and I talk about all the ideas related to these things that were, I did in this video on my podcast, the Perception Action Podcast. So uh, thanks for listening today, and, and hopefully uh, not, not lecturing you too much. Um, this is I, I'm really happy you joined me, and cheers for now. <laughs>